Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Press Play Lifestyle Inspired Podcast, where we do interviews with interesting and inspiring people to help you, our listeners, find the resources, tools, and support you need to be your best inspired self. Today, we are super lucky to have a new friend of ours, John, who has written a recent book, Join Our Podcast. How are you doing today, John? Hi, Jackie. Thanks very much uh, for having me on the podcast. You're very, very welcome. So John has a wonderful last name that I'm going to let him go ahead and pronounce so that I don't murder it. Uh, So John, why don't you say that again? Vespasian. Yes, Vespasian. Very easy to pronounce, Vespasian. (laughs) It's very easy to pronounce. That's right. Um, So why don't you tell us a little bit about your recent book that you just came out with, John? Yeah, the title is uh, Undisrupted. Uh, how um, highly effective people deal with disruptions. I think it's a very uh, useful topic in these times of this uh, coronavirus where people are really uh, interrupted in their normal activities. So what I've done in in this book uh, is to go through dozens of biographies in history in different centuries, different professions, uh, different countries, uh, to analyze how people in different areas, I mean, business, uh, in um, in art, uh, in the military, how they deal with uh, major disruptions in their lives and try to establish the patterns uh, that uh, help people actually recover very quickly or to, to circumvent uh, disruptions and to identify also the patterns that uh, make people uh, collapse. Uh, very often some people uh, seem to be doing pretty well in life and then they get some problems and they collapse completely. So I try to discover the patterns behind uh, by looking at history. This is, this is the, the, the thread that goes through all my books. Awesome. So in terms of all that research that you were able to do and looking at the patterns in history, what is the key that you've uncovered, if any, to dealing effectively with disruptions? Yeah, there is, a, there is a pattern you find, I think, almost in every story. Uh, people who are uh, very effective uh, in dealing with disruptions, and sometimes, I mean, in the book, I have very extreme examples, people who, who suffer uh, major accidents, who lose their jobs, who go bankrupt. People who do very well, who recover fairly quickly, are those who go back to the basics, who do... Um, things they know very well, they go back to their basic skills, uh, they rely on friends they know for 20 years, uh, they stay uh, in a territory they know very well, so they, they uh, are actually able to, to rebuild their lives fairly quickly. On the contrary, uh, people who uh, are completely wiped out, even if they are millionaires, even if they are very clever, sophisticated, uh, even if they have uh, connections and, and many, many, many assets, uh, you see history people being completely destroyed uh, because they make uh, the, the major mistake you should not make when you're dealing with disruption, which is improvisation. They, it happens very often that people who are um, extremely gifted and, and, uh, and wealthy and, and they are on top of everything. Uh, when they get a problem, they start to improvise because they assume that they are able to deal um, with any new situation and they are able to invent uh, solutions uh, as they go. And this is extremely dangerous because when you're dealing with a crisis, um, this is the last thing you should do. You should not improvise. Never improvise when you are under uh, extreme pressure. Uh, because the learning curve can kill you. Uh, when you are really uh, fighting against time, you're trying to, to, to solve problems. Sometimes people are very sick or very, very much in, in uh, financial problems. Do not improvise. Do not start a business when you're completely against the wall. Uh, do not try to, uh, to change your lifestyle from one day to the next. This is usually a killer. And I found examples in different centuries, in different professions, in different uh, uh, countries. I didn't find a single exception. Uh, People who improvise uh, tend to fail very, very seriously. So if improvisation is not a great idea in like turbulent times, and I would say right now a lot of us feel like we're going through some unusual times, is there some ways that you can protect yourself as an individual and kind of make it through these times a little more effectively? Yes, um, there are several techniques I found in history that are very, very useful. 
uh, let me just uh, expand a bit on this because it's, uh, especially in these times uh, where many people are restrained in their ability to work, their ability to actually uh, live a normal life, I think it's very interesting. And I think the most relevant uh, chapter in this case is the one about uh, cathedrals, because I, I wrote uh, in the book, there is a, a complete chapter about uh, how they built cathedrals in the Middle Ages. So we are talking about the 11th century, 12th century, we're talking about Gothic uh, cathedrals. And in Europe, um, uh, you find many of them in France, in Germany, in the, in the United Kingdom. And they look uh, very pretty, very uh, solid. Uh, I mean, they've be, been there for, for now uh, 11 centuries. But you have to realize that uh, they were built under very uh, difficult uh, conditions. I mean, in, in that time, in the 11th century, 12th century, uh, most people uh, could barely earn their living. They were completely illiterate. Uh, they spoke different languages. So it was very difficult to communicate in the workplace. Uh, the winter was very, very cold, much colder than today, because now people are, are afraid of the, of the uh, global warming. At that time, it was global cooling. It was very, very cold. The, the logistics were a nightmare. It was very difficult to transport uh, not only people, but to transport um, uh, stones. If you want to build a cathedral, you need thousands of stones. It was very difficult to transport the stones. So in the end, um, uh, people wanted to improve the churches. They wanted to improve the way they dealt with, uh, actually with uh, business, with uh, ideas, but uh, they thought it was impossible. Uh, there were so many obstacles, so many um, uh, constraints. And in the end, uh, it was one uh, monk, his name was Suzier, uh, who figured out uh, a system uh, that allowed him to build these amazing buildings uh, with uh, relatively few resources uh, by uh, using the constraints. And this is something that uh, when we're now today in the 21st century facing constraints, I think the idea is very powerful. Now, when Suje uh, took over because he was appointed uh, abbot in a monastery uh, close to uh, Paris, it's in Saint-Denis, it's about 20 kilometers north of Paris. He was appointed abbot, he was in his 40s. And he has traveled, uh, he has been traveling uh, around Europe because he was a monk. And at that time, monks could actually move uh, from monastery to monastery for a couple of years, and then they went back. So Suzier was aware of the new uh, possibilities, the new building techniques. He was aware of the new materials. But he also realized that uh, it was impossible to build uh, high cathedrals. It was impossible to do all things because there were too many constraints. For instance, uh, the sheer problem uh, of the temperature, which today in the 21st century we don't even care because uh, we have uh, heating and we have the, in the in the in the Middle Ages they didn't have all that. So the the way they work is similar to this coronavirus story because uh, they hire people in um, during the spring and the summer, and then when the winter comes, when the coronavirus comes, they have to fire everybody because they have to close down the shop. Uh, people just dis disband and they come back in September. And of course, this was a nightmare. You cannot really run any kind of business like this. And Suje realized that uh, this was not, uh, it was not possible. If you build a cathedral like this, it will take you 30 years. And he didn't have enough money. He wanted to do it very quickly. So, I mean, this was just an example, but uh, in, the, in the book, I go into detail of, uh, all the uh, constraints that Suje had to deal with and how he actually find a way around. So the main principle, uh, when you're dealing with this situation where you have so many constraints, you have so many uh, disruptions, because the book is about disruptions, what Suje was, uh, what Suje did uh, was to design a system of work that uh, enabled him to, uh, to progress every day, uh, in every circumstances, in every circumstance, even if it was cold, even if uh, there was a problem with communication, even if uh, people sometimes they were completely lost because they came from different uh, backgrounds, they didn't have training, uh, it was very difficult to train people in different languages, very difficult to give instructions. So Suje uh, built actually a business system uh, that was very solid uh, because it enabled people to work day after day, even uh, during the disruptions. Just to give you an example. Uh, the first thing he did uh, was not to build the cathedral but uh, to cover for the possibility that uh, there were going to be many days in the year, actually several months in the year from, um, 
from May until October, sorry, uh, from uh, October until, uh, until April, where he could not work because it was too cold outside. So the first thing he did was not to start building the cathedral, but to build uh, houses, to build workshops, where he could put uh, his people during the winter. And even if outside was very cold, even if they could not go outside, they could still produce, they could still uh, uh, work, they could still earn a living because they could actually uh, cut stones uh, during the winter uh, to the right size, and then in the summer they could go outside and they could actually build the cathedral. And by finding all these uh, shortcuts, which is the, the idea of the book, uh, uh, how to actually deal with disruptions by, by using different uh, techniques, uh, he was able to uh, build the cathedral very quickly, and he built the first cathedral at Saint-Denis. Uh, people were amazed, actually they traveled uh, hundreds of kilometers to see how is it possible that this guy put up this building so quickly. Uh, and this is something that we have to learn to do today. Even if we are facing constraints and we are facing disruptions, um, uh, in some countries I think it's extreme, the kind of disruptions uh, people are facing. Uh, you have to prepare your life, you have to prepare yourself uh, for these kind of situations. Maybe this time uh, it caught you by surprise because you didn't have a, a system to deal with kind of disruption, but next time there is no excuse. I think it's time for most people to start building their lives, their business, their, their, their working uh, uh, arrangements in a way that uh, next time if something similar happens, uh, they're fully protected. So um, to try to summarize that, would you say that the best way to protect yourself from um, a large disruption like the one that we're experienced and some of the people in the book have is to be prepared ahead of time for those disruptions. Is that what I heard you say, John? Uh, not necessarily because you cannot really uh, foresee all the problems, but uh, the idea behind this, um, this example, the, the, uh, the cathedral uh, builders, is that if you have a basic uh, lifestyle or a basic uh, work system in your company, in your, in your, say, it could also apply to your health, huh? to your, to your uh, lifestyle, in general, to your nutrition uh, habits, to your diet, um, you have a system which is basically solid and is basically uh, very resilient because you have margins like uh, Sujier had when he was building the cathedral, he has sufficient margins. And you have a business that can earn income uh, from different sources and something is disrupting, the, for instance, uh, one area of your business, you can still work on the other areas. And now that uh, many people are not uh, able to work normally, uh, if you have a, a business with different uh, areas, it's a good moment uh, to work on product development because this is something you can do uh, off-site. You don't uh, to work on other areas that cannot, you cannot do on-site, uh, but you have to find a way to uh, structure your life so that uh, disruptions do not uh, destroy you. They could annoy you, they could uh, delay a bit uh, the progress, but uh, you should be sufficiently protected by your lifestyle, by your arrangements, so that uh, these kind of disruptions uh, do not have a very negative impact on your life. So what factors, if any, are making people more or less vulnerable today? Yeah, the, the main problem is a psychological problem because the, now uh, when we have this crisis, this coronavirus, and people say, oh, you have these problems, that, that, and they make a, a, a big deal. Um, you have to realize that uh, what is preventing us from, from um, uh, preventing and protecting ourselves is basically a psychological problem, it's basically a philosophical problem. We have, um, in industrialized countries specifically, uh, we have built in our psychology uh, a delusion of uh, continuity. And since we are uh, used to having uh, very stable situations in the in the financial markets, in the, in the working arrangements, uh, sometimes even legislation, we assume that uh, tomorrow uh, will be pretty much like today. And that uh, two years from now will be 5% better, and 10 years from now will be 20% better. And we have this linear um, uh, idea of the future, which is very unrealistic. And when you look at history, you see that uh, it doesn't work like this. It never worked like this, not even in the, in the most uh, uh, stable societies in history, it never worked like this. There was always 
uh, disruptions, there were always discontinuities through technology, uh, through uh, political upheavals, uh, through uh, uh, viruses, history. But our belief in continuity today in the 21st century is extreme. I mean, people uh, tend to be horrified by any uh, disruptions. They think disruptions are unfair. They should not take place. Uh, they don't want to bother with any kind of disruptions, but you will get disruptions in your life. Even if you are uh, um, very lucky uh, in your career and in your investments and you don't go through any uh, bankruptcy or any uh, uh, problems with your personal finances, even then you will sure uh, get sick at some problems uh, with your health or you will have family problems. Everybody goes through disruptions. The main uh, uh, obstacle we have, the main factor of vulnerability is the psychological belief in uh, continuity. Uh, this is very dangerous. We should uh, overcome it. This is one of the uh, main uh, purposes of my book, uh, to show people how to change this belief, which is wrong, and try to, uh, to become uh, more self-reliant. Wonderful. I, I love that idea that essentially, um, it's like the fallacy of continuity, right? We assume forever when history doesn't show that to be true at all. Uh, one of the other things that you talk about in your book, and I think is, I'd love to see what your perspective is, is you do encourage your readers to embrace certain types of disruptions. Could you um, talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, uh, the, the book doesn't try to push the idea that uh, life should be perfectly smooth. This is, this is also nonsense. I mean, what I'm trying to do is to, um, uh, to show different strategies to, uh, to use uh, disruptions uh, to your advantage, to deal with them, and sometimes to embrace them. Uh, because one of the, the patterns I found uh, in the biographies I, I, I present in the book, they are really short biographies, sometimes they are two or three pages each. I really try to go to the key issue in the biographies, not to tell a lot of uh, anecdotes, but just to really show the, the lesson, is that when you are uh, in a situation, uh, which could be in your job, could be in your personal finances, could be in your health, that uh, you feel stuck, and I think uh, for most people, uh, the problem in life is not that uh, they don't have goals or they don't have dreams. The problem is that they are stuck, or we are stuck, uh, and we don't have really a clear idea how to, uh, to get um, unstuck or how to pro progress because it's so disruptive. And if you have a job and you are doing more or less uh, well, and you have friends and you have, in your, you have your, your uh, habits and you have your, your life is settled down, in a certain pattern is very uh, difficult to break uh, down, even if you know that you could do much better, even if you know that uh, you are missing on some great opportunities, but it's very difficult to, to, to get out of the rut. It's very difficult to, uh, to get unstuck. And one of the messages from the book, and I present also very, um, I think very compelling uh, examples, is that when you are in a situation where you really stuck, you don't see any way of improvement because maybe because your your career is is uh, is is such a ceiling, uh, because your business is uh, is not growing, because the company you are working for uh, is uh, is obsolete. I mean, for many reasons, uh, to go through disruptions is really the only way. Uh, you have to go through some disruptions. You have to uh, sometimes to move to another city, sometimes to change your friends, to change your lifestyle, to change or to acquire additional skills. The question is how, how you do it. And the, the lessons I drew from these stories is that uh, you should take a safe approach. I would never uh, advise people say, just do it, just go for it. Uh, don't think about it. I don't think this is, a, this is a realistic approach. It's a recipe for disaster. As I said at the beginning, uh, improvisation is the cardinal sin. Don't fall for it. It's pure nonsense. Uh, the best examples of uh, successful people in history are people who do things uh, relatively uh, smoothly. They try to transition from one situation to the other. They go through disruptions, but uh, they have a plan B. They don't uh, jump off the cliff and then say, okay, maybe they ha something will happen, a miracle will happen. Don't trust miracles, don't expect miracles. Try to do things uh, by having a plan B, by having a... a a, a, a situation where you can feel relatively confident 
uh, that uh, you're going to, uh, to succeed. And I can give you a few examples from the book that are uh, taken from history, how people actually changed from one career to the other uh, because they were completely stuck, they were very unhappy, and they decided to do something different, and they did it in a very clever way, in a very safe way that I recommend. Wonderful. Uh, the, so speaking of there are no miracles, sort of, and you know, don't just jump and be a little bit more strategic in your change. You talk a little bit about prophets of doom as well in your book. I wonder if you could tell us what that warning is about and what you meant by, you know, be weary of the prophets of doom. Yes, uh, this is a phenomenon that is not only uh, typical of the 21st century. Okay, today we have maybe a bit more than usual because uh, we have all this media, uh, not only television, but also these uh, YouTube channels and uh, podcasts, and we have all these uh, possibilities of media. And of course, uh, every um, uh, moderator, every uh, producer wants to have uh, as many uh, uh, watchers, as many uh, readers as possible. So they try to make it very compelling, very much uh, uh, attractive to the, to the audience. And you see, it's very easy to get uh, a large audience by, by, by frightening people, by, by scaring people, by telling uh, uh, gloom and doom stories about uh, society is going to collapse or going to die. Uh, and this is going on for years. I mean, uh, you know that um, there is a saying in, in the media, in the news that uh, if it bleeds, it leads. That they try to also try to put uh, stories that are very much uh, scary, and uh, bloody and, and accidents. And we have uh, many uh, news commentators that uh, they made a career by spreading uh, fear, by spreading uh, uh, stories about uh, interpretation, I would say more than stories, interpretations of, of the facts that are very compelling, they're very entertaining, and this I cannot deny. Uh, people feel uh, hooked on that and they watch hours and hours and hours. But in the end, uh, if you look at it objectively, it's pretty much a waste of time because they, they, they spread fear, they spread uh, uncertainty, they make people very anxious. It's very compelling, it's very good entertainment. But what I try to, to present in the book is that uh, when you look at it in perspective, it's not a good use of your time. Uh, if you really want to be able to deal with disruptions, to prepare yourself, uh, to become more effective, to improve your skills, uh, this is not a good use of your time uh, to become anxious, stressed uh, just by uh, uh, watching these uh, stories that are so interesting. Uh, it's not going to improve your life. It's going to maybe uh, prevent you from sleeping well, which is uh, a key to your health. So I make a case that uh, this uh, entertainment it should be seen as entertainment, but should not be uh, conditioning your life should not uh, uh, prevent you uh, from taking constructive action to improve your life. So be very careful with this uh, prophet of doom. Prophets of doom, there are too many, uh, even to mention one of them, because there are, there are hundreds of them in different areas. Uh, don't get hooked on them because they are very entertaining, but uh, they can be very destructive uh, to your psychology. Wow. Yeah. Uh, th so there's so many more, more amazing lessons in your book um, about prophets of doom and just ways to protect yourself, ways to be smart. Uh, before we wrap up, because we don't, unfortunately, we can't talk all day about the book. Uh, is there anything you, of all of those lessons that are in the book, John, that you really want to make sure that the prospective readers that the readers take away from the from your time that you spent putting this book together. Yeah, if, if you uh, just take one idea from this uh, interview from my book, and you say, just yeah, I only have one minute, I just want to have the, the perfect uh, uh, piece of advice. Um, you have to realize that uh, most people nowadays, uh, we live uh, 90 years, maybe you live uh, 100 years. Uh, it's not so useful to the, today to have people live in 95, 96 years. You have to realize that uh, if this is your life expectancy, uh, most of the disruptions we are facing today, uh, financial, uh, for your health, your job, uh, when you look at them in the perspective of a lifetime, uh, they lose uh, their severity. They become dissolved. 
Um, people who lose their job, sometimes they lose a good job and they become very depressed. How I'm going to find a job now? I mean, the next week, the next month, maybe it will take you a few months to find another job. Maybe you have to move to another country. Maybe you have to learn another language. Maybe you have to do something. But the idea is that when you look at uh, disruptions, most of them, not all of them, but when you look at disruptions in the perspective of a lifetime, and you're going to live 90 years, 95 years, uh, you become more effective because you don't need to get super anxious, super stressed about uh, the loss of a job, uh, the financial uh, problems you might have, uh, family problems. Look at things from the perspective of life. You are going to live 90 years, you're going to live 95 years. Uh, you don't need to solve all the problems tomorrow. You have enough time to, uh, to find a, a better job, to rearrange your finances, to solve your health problems. There is enough time. Uh, life is not very long, but it's also not very short. Uh, remember, uh, if you are going to look at problems in the perspective of, of the lifetime, there is plenty of time to find solutions. Don't go crazy just by looking at things uh, from a short-term perspective, because this is not the right perspective. Great advice, John. So don't don't go crazy thinking about you know how this one thing can affect your whole life because you still have your whole life ahead of you. So where can people find this amazing book so they can, you know, support your efforts so you can keep writing some new ones? So where is Undisrupted going to be found for people the easiest? Yeah, it's very, very easy to find. Uh, if, you, if you type my name on Google or any uh, search engine, my name is John Vespasian. Even if you uh, type it incorrectly, it doesn't matter because it's so unusual that uh, <laughs> the, the, the search engine will correct you. You type John Vespasian, you will find in a second my books. Uh, there is a blog with uh, hundreds of uh, free articles. There is a free newsletter. Just type John Vespasian on the internet. You will find everything in one second. Wonderful. So we're also going to put links to some of your um, easy-to-reach sites in the show notes. But I want to say thank you so much for taking the time. I know it's a little later over there for you and um, talking to us about your book. It sounds... I hope it can help as many people as I think it can. And I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today. Many thanks, uh, Jackie. All right, talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. -bye. bye, -bye.